Hi, everyone. Um, good evening and welcome to our interventional radiology webinar this evening. My name is Helene and I'm the Workforce Development at the West Vic PHN. And my colleague Jade is alongside me who will do the um, all the IT stuff behind the scenes. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we are all zooming in. We recognise their diversity, resilience and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and I wish to extend that respect to my First Nation, to any First Nations people connecting in today. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determination for First Nations peoples and organisations and we'll work, we'll work together on closing the gap. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. The majority of our webinar events are recorded and available on our PHN Learn YouTube channel. Jade has the link on the screen at the moment. Um, I have our upcoming events on, on the screen. You can register for these events via our website. A special mention for our upcoming primary care conference. This is hybrid and there will you can attend Geelong, Horsham or Warrnambool um, or dial in remotely. The theme is toddler to teen health and we look forward to seeing you there. We already have a large audience, so make sure you register for that event. Please make note of the Vic, um, West Vic Health Pathways on the screen at the moment that, that is related to this topic. If you have entered the webinar, not if, if you've entered this webinar, not displaying your accurate first and last name, could you please type your full name into the chat box? Only admin will see this. This will ensure you can we can issue with a certificate of attendance. Uh, for this evening's webinar, all petitions, participants will remain on mute. If you have any questions, just type them in the question and answer box and then I'll ask them on your behalf to the presenter at the end of the session. There is a link to our evaluation. Please make sure you fill that out. This evening's webinar is um, speaker is Dr. Steele Scott, specialist radiologist. I'll now hand over to Steele. Thanks, Steele. Thank you. Perfect. So um, thank you everyone for attending tonight's talk and those watching uh, later online. Thank you to the Western Victorian PHM for having me here tonight. My name is Steele and I'm an interventional radiologist. Just a quick background on myself. I trained in radiology at BMI, graduating with a fellowship in 2020. After this, I worked in various regional and remote locations around Australia, including far north and central Queensland, working as remote as Mount Isa. It was there that I realized the demand for uh, capable interventional radiologists around Australia. I subsequently performed a fellowship in interventional radiology at St. Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne, before coming back to Geelong as a consultant interventionalist. As well as working at University Hospital Geelong, I run an interventional radiology clinic called Holistic Imaging. We offer uh, consulting and angiographic operating capabilities through our friends at St John of God. We aim to provide a no-gap service whilst offering a patient-centred solution to all endovascular and interventional radiology needs. So what is interventional radiology? I get told by a lot of doctors that radiology must be boring. Who would want to work in a dark room without windows? More often than not, clinicians and patients don't know what interventional radiology is, other than maybe removing the occasional implant on. But interventional radiology is an exciting specialty that offers the perfect blend of intellectual stimulation through diagnostic imaging interpretation and interpersonal relationships with patients and clinicians through our procedures. Interventional radiology is, uh, is, is a relatively modern specialty which uses state-of-the-art imaging for precise treatments of complex diseases and conditions. In most cases, IR is the definition of minimally invasive. It's very rare that we cannot perform a diagnostic or therapeutic intervention through an incision less than five millimetres in size. Procedures that, we, that uh, you may be familiar with include endovascular treatment of complex peripheral vascular disease, nephrostomy and ureteric stent insertion, cholecystostomy insertion, including complex biliary access and stenting, portosystemic shunt creation or otherwise TIPS procedures, as well as interventional oncological procedures such as transarterial chemoembolization of tumors. We even perform vertebroplasty in acute and subacute vertebral fractures with significant symptomatic benefit. The list goes on. 
I guess when you think endovascular or minimally invasive, uh, think interventional radiology. Interventional radiologists are foremost specialist diagnostic radiologists. This is critical given endovascular or imaging guided procedures are reliant on a clear understanding of radiation safety, diagnostic imaging interpretation, and radiological anatomy. Follow, following completion of, a of five years of diagnostic imaging, IRs are required to do further subspecialist fellowship training, usually in the form of one to two year interventional fellowship, where we perform only complex interventional procedures. So as you can see, we're highly trained in both imaging guided procedures and the relevant imaging and radiological anatomy interpre interpretation required to perform these procedures safely. IR is a modern specialty. It was in 1953 that Seldinger, a Swedish radiologist, first described the process of endovascular access with a sharp hollow needle, utilizing a wire for safe serial upsizing to an access sheath. The simple process founded the core of interventional radiology. 10 years later, Dr. Charles Dotter, a radiologist, became the first interventionalist to perform femoral angioplasty. Under the clear instructions of a vascular surgeon to visualize but not try to fix an SFA hiatus stenosis, he performed the first successful angioplasty in a claudicant who, would, who was advised that amputation would be the only potential treatment. She went on to have symptomatic relief and died from an unrelated issue years later whilst maintaining her limb. But as you can see, over the years, our equipment has become more sophisticated, our radiation protection a bit more evident, and our breadth of procedures operators has increased exponentially. As interventional radiologists, we have the benefit of using a magnitude of state-of-the-art equipment to navigate and plan our interventions. From live targeted procedures utilizing ultrasound to complex uh, procedures requiring precision static uh, targeting with CT, even endovascular interventions utilizing state-of-the-art angiography suites, if a disease can be visualized on imaging, typically an IR can offer a minimally invasive option for diagnosis or treatment. BMI is particularly fortunate as we have recently made Geelong Hospital's largest capital acquisition in history, having obtained only Australia's second state-of-the-art hybrid CT angiography unit. This suite will be a significant game changer for minimally invasive procedures and complex on oncological interventions, as we will now be able to utilize both angiography and CT to perform more complex endovascular procedures safely, safely with improved accuracy and precision. Some of the procedures which we currently offer include percutaneous ablation of solid organ tumors, such as this left three centimeter renal cell carcinoma, which you can see here. Using hydro dissection from the adjacent psoas muscle and co a continuous cooling of the collecting system with a nephrostomy, we can perform thermal ablations at temperatures of up to 100 to 140 degrees to destroy the tumors with curative intent. Patients are typically discharged the next morning with minimal post-procedural pain. Here is a 1.5 centimetre hepatocellular carcinoma confined to segment eight of the liver in a precarious subdiaphragmatic uh, position. However, with the creation of a deliberate pneumothorax, diaphragmatic cooling and irrigation, and steep needle, needle angulation, uh, we are able to safely perform, perform curative tumour ablation. Typically, we find that we can perform accurate and safe curative ablations of multiple tumours under three centimetres in size in a multitude of different organs. So let's now talk about embolotherapy. Embolization was first described by Charles Dodder in 1970, where he used an autologous clot from the patient for the endovascular treatment and control of a bleeding gastric ulcer. From that embolization, which is the percutaneous or end endovascular application of an agent or device to accomplish vascular occlusion, he, he has been used to treat a multitude of conditions, including but not limited to active traumatic and non-traumatic hemorrhage and tumor ablation for, for both benign and malignant conditions. 
Embolotherapy is generally performed under digital subtracted imaging using an arterial or venous access, depending on the pathology, through a skin incision measuring five millimeters, hydrophilic and flexible catheters measuring approximately one millimeter in diameter, are advanced to the relevant blood vessel for targeted treatments. As you can see here, um, this is usually the this is just an access sheath that we use. And these are a multitude of different catheters that we can use uh, with different angulated tips so that we can uh, navigate and access different blood vessels. We use a large array of embolic equipment now compared to the days of the first embolization. These include temporary embolic materials, which absorb over a short time, generally, re generally reserved for cases of trauma or acute hemorrhage, where pre pre preserved vascular flow in the future is a possibility as opposed to more permanent embolics, including small calibrated plastic particles or even fi fibred platinum coils. Every pathology we treat has a different embolic, which is recommended and suited for use. Common embolization procedures which we get asked to perform include embolization for active bleeding, as demonstrated in this case of an active duodenal uh, active uh, duodenal bleeding where you can see the blush here. And we managed to get our, our macro catheter and small micro catheters into the target blood vessel where we've coiled off a, the gastroduodenal artery with both gel foam and small platinum metallic coils. This was performed after failed endoscopic attempts at hemostasis. Chemoembolization of large multifocal hepatocellular carcinomas in segment of the of aid of the liver is something that, that we do often, chemoembolization of liver tumors using lipidol, a poppy, poppy seed-based oil, doxyrubicin, a chemotherapy agent, and small caliber plastic particles. The aim to both treat the lesions with chemotherapy and deprive the tumor of its vascular bed essential for growth. On the right, you can see the lesion staining, staining of the lesion and the relevant feeding blood vessels, vessels consistent with a good embolic res response. This is a case of a large angiomyelopoma or AML of the left kidney, which is a benign tumor comprised of cells in their correct location, but, for performing, but forming disorganized masses. Generally, we recommend treatment of these lesions when they grow larger than three centimetres, given they contain abnormal aneurysmal blood vessels at risk of hemorrhage. This was a 14 centimetre angiomyelopoma. We utilised a combination of ethanol, lipidol and coils to obtain, both, to obtain both damage to the blood vessels and promote complete vascular occlusion of the lesion, preventing further hemorrhage. This is another case of a smaller three centimeter AML treated again with ethanol and lipidol to again uh, cause vascular occlusion. So you can hear, see here the small blood vessels feeding the uh, exophytic lesion uh, with post-procedure demonstrating good opacification and embolization of the lesion and nice preservation of the renal cortex. We also embolize all visceral aneurysms at risk of rupture, including this visceral aneurysm treated with platinum coils caused from elevated arterial velocities from a median arcuate ligament syndrome. As you can see, embolotherapy has many potential applications. This is another case of a right femoral hypervascular renal cell carcinoma treated with embolotherapy prior to nailing with orthopedics. With embolization of the feeding vessels, the patient was able to have an essential, essentially bloodless operation. So here you can see multiple feeding lesions to the uh, renal cell carcinoma. And on the post embolization, where you can see several small coils, and we also use small sand light particles to block off the blood flow, there's no further vascularity within the lesion at all. So as you can see, embolotherapy has many potential applications and should be performed by a highly trained interventional radiologist. So as you can see, there's a magnitude uh, of pathologies that are all suited to selective embolization therapy with trained radiologists, interventional radiologists. However, there's, there are several IR-based procedures which may be of significant interest to general practice. 
One of these procedures is uterine artery embolization for symptomatic fibroids. Uri uterine artery embolization is not a new procedure. We commonly perform UAE for indications including postpartum hemorrhage or vascular malformations involving the uterus, where the patient is keen to preserve uterus function for future childbearing. It was in 1974 that the first UAE was performed by Dr. Merland, a Paris neuroradiologist in the setting of menorrhagia in a severely disabled patient. In 1995, Dr. Merlin published the first multi-center trial demonstrating the significant benefits of UAE on patients with fibroids. His study of 16 patients demonstrated symptomatic improvement in 11, partial improvement in three, and the requirement of further surgical intervention in only two. It was this that initiated global interest in UAE as a uterine sparing treatment option in women with fibroids. It was from this that the benefits of UAE in symptomatic fibroids and now adenomyosis were established. The principle of UAE is simple. Through adequate embolization of the uterine artery, we see an associated fibroid shrinkage and reduction in fibroid related symptoms from fibroid devascularization. Whilst the normal uterus tissue remains, it maintains its blood supply from the vast array of collateralized vasculature. So what are uterine fibroids? They are the most common benign tumor in females, up to percent of females having at least one fibroid by the age of 50. Of these, 30% are symptomatic. Symptoms are generally related to disruption of the uterus resulting in abnormal or excessive uterine bleeding. Patients can also have mass-related symptoms resulting in pelvic pain, discomfort, or compression-related symptoms. Typical ind indications for uh, treatment include uterine fibroids causing significant lifestyle altering, altering symptoms, heavy menstrual bleeding, dysmenorrhea or anemia, or fibroids causing mass effect. Unfortunately, despite over 100,000 embolization procedures being performed safely around the world, too many patients are advised that hysterectomy or waiting until menopause are their only options. Many patients who are keen for a uterus sparing option are either not advised about UAE or told that this option remains unavailable to them. However, there is extensive data that demonstrates that compared to hysterectomy, UAE has significant benefits, including lower blood loss, shorter hospital states, stays, quicker resumption of work in the short term, mid and long-term results showing comparable health-related quality of life results as compared to hysterectomy. There is, however, an increased risk of requirement of re-intervention. However, this is expected in a treatment where, the, where uterine preservation is the aim. Several well-known RCTs have confirmed that UAE is a good alternative to hysterectomy in patients keen to preserve their uterus. This includes the REST trial, which demonstrated shorter hospitalization times, faster return to work, and reduced complication rates of UAE as compared to hysterectomy. And the EMI trial, which also demonstrated that UAE and surgical interventions offered the same health-related quality of life income, outcome. There are several expected contraindications to uterine artery embolization, and these include active pregnancy, given the risk to the de developing fetus, infection, and active gynecological malignancies. A relative contraindication includes a desire to made ch maintain childbearing potential. However, more and more data is coming to the front demonstrating multiple su successful pregnancy after, after embolization. In a recent study published this year, it was demonstrated that pregnancy outcomes in patients older than 40 were comparable to age-matched population statistics in the UAE groups, confirming that patients can have viable pregnancies after uterine artery embolization. So how do we do the procedure? This was a recent case of a 40-year-old female presenting with heavy period-related uterine bleeding, anemia, and ultrasound-confirmed fibroids. She had, she had several years of consultation with specialists where she was eventually referred for consideration of UAE after reading about the procedure online. She asked her doctor for a referral to an interventional radiologist. As you can see here, uh, we typically detect uh, uterine fibroids as a first step through uh, ultrasound. 
which in this case demonstrated multiple intramural and one subserosal fibroid, typically characterized by hypoechoic heterogeneous ma masses confined to the uh, confined to the uterus. Typically, we perform pre-procedure MRI to exclude any gynecological malignancies, assess pre-procedural vascular mapping and fibroid localization. On the MRI, a large dominant left posterior fibroid, which you can be, see here, indents the endometrial cavity and was identified to likely be the culprit lesion uh, uh, causing her symptoms. On the MRI mapping, which is non, uh, which uh, has no radiation, uh, we typically use this to identify the course of the uterine artery, make sure that they are the dominant supplier to the, to the uterus and ensure that there's no evidence of definitive aberrant vasculature that we can see uh, to the fibroids. Uh, this patient subsequently consented to treatment and angiography and embolization was performed under local anesthetic and sedation. We performed a pigtail run from the level of the renal arteries to demonstrate the uterine arteries and exclude any significant ovarian artery contribution or variant anatomy. As you can see here, this is our pigtail catheter, uh, good opacification of normal renal arteries. And then on the second slide here, which is just times directly after the first, we can see that there's gradual filling of the uterine arteries here with no definitive supply to the uterus from the ovarian arteries and no variant anatomy. Some variant supplies to fibroids can include uh, blood vessels coming off the renal artery, adrenal arteries, lumbar arteries, internal uh, inferior mammary uh, artery, iliac arteries, and the ov ovarian arteries. And this is all called parasitic, va parasitic vascularity. Um, we also look to ensure that there's no utero ovarian anastomosis, which can be treated, however, may predispose to inadvertent ovarian embolization if not detected. This is a nice uh, picture demonstrating uh, our macro catheter uh, going over the aortic uh, bifurc uh, bifurcation. Um, contrast has been injected, filling the anterior division of the internal iliac arteries with nice contrast flow through the identified uterine artery. After micro selection, uh, of the uh, left uterine artery, you can see that we've got good contrast to pacification through the uterine artery and then contrast filling the spiral arteries of the uterus. And this is likely the blood vessel that was supplying that dominant left uh, posterior uh, fibroid given the, um, the, the nice rich um, vascularity to that region. Once we micro select that, uh, that uh, vessel with a micro catheter, which is almost hair, hair size, uh, we then perform uh, our embolotherapy. And this is a good demonstration or a nice little diagram that demonstrates how we inject small particles, uh, which are almost the size of sand, uh, into the uterine artery, where we get clumping uh, of these par particles together in the target vessels, an event which eventually results in vessel blockage and occlusion. We typically continue embolization until we get a relative sluggish flow in the uterine artery. So you can see here, this is at the end of embolization where there's no significant filling of those, of those spiral arteries without contrast anymore, demonstrating good uh, embolization. Following inclusion of the left uterine artery, we use a reverse curve catheter. So this is a catheter that flicks back on itself uh, to subsequently perform targeted embolization of the contralateral uterine artery. And you can see here, this is before uh, embolization where you can see the filling of the uterine artery and the spiral arteries. And that at the end of our embolotherapy, you can see that there's a reduction in flow through the uterine artery um, consistent with a good, uh, good procedural stasis and good occlusion. Um, so I've just got here a picture uh, of our usual embolic setup. We use a separate trolley for embolization to mitigate axil in accidental injection of occlusive particles. In fibroids, we typically use 500 micron particles with good result. These are very small, but still visible to the human eye as small snowflakes in a syringe, and you can see them there. 
In cases of adenomyosis, which is where endometrial tissue grows inappropriately into the myometrium, resulting in some patients having symptoms of pelvic pain and menorrhagia, we use a 1-2-3 prot protocol of embolic. This is the injection of first 150 micron particles, followed by 250 micron particles, and then 355 micron particles to get even better embolic penetration to the small abnormal or small capillaries uh, and abnormal endometrial cells, uh, usually with good results. Studies have demonstrated up to an 87% reduction in symptoms of patients with adenomyosis who undergo UAE, which is also good. This, and most, uh, this patient and, and most of our patients are typically admitted for one night with a PCA and subsequently discharged with oral antibiotics and analgesia. Um, this patient had no major complications and described immediate symptomatic relief at her next period with return to work within seven days. The complications of UAE include major infection, which is attributed to endometritis following a devascularization de procedure. This is typically mitigated with a short course of oral and intraoperative antibiotics. Transcervical expulsion is the delivery of a fibroid following sloughing at UAE. This can be a shock for a patient, however, it can be considered as a definitive outcome given the fibroid is no longer present within the uterus. Ovarian failure, which is reported at less than 1%, is a very rare risk and is likely a result of inadequate identif identification of variant anatomy or utero-ovarian anastomoses. This is why we perform standard pre-embolization pigtail runs throughout the aorta, just to make sure that we exclude uh, them being present. A very nice and concise summary of the outcomes and complications rates of UAE and its surgical counter counterparts were published in the Australian Physician. As you can see, UAE is a safe and valuable treatment option in the treatment of uterine fibroids. UAE has better results as compared to myomectomy in the setting of abnormal uterine bleeding and good results in bulk-related symptoms. UAE has a quicker return to work. As you can see, the return to work uh, is uh, typically um, return to normal activities even as well, um, is typically uh, a month better uh, than hysterectomy in the UAE, UAE cohort. So eight days as compared to uh, 36 days in the two surgical options. Um, UAE offers a significant reduction in overall procedural related complication, most notably a reduction rate of bleeding as compared to both surgical options. And I guess that's because we're performing embolotherapy to stop blood flow. So uterine artery embolization is a safe alternative to hysterectomy in patients with symptomatic uterine fibroids wishing to preserve their uterus. As such, symptomatic patients with uterine fibroids should be offered UAE as a treatment option in the management of their condition. UAE does not preclude future hysterectomy and may in fact result in diminished interruptive bleeding if required in the future. So given the topic, I thought I would talk quickly about another two topics of value to general practice. And these are pelvic venous congestion syndrome and in the same realm of interest, male varicoceles, both easily treated with embolotherapy. So pelvic venous congestion uh, is a, co a collection of pelvic varicose veins secondary to retrograde flow through incompetent valves in the ovarian veins. 30% of patients with chronic pelvic pain, uh, it can be attributed to pelvic ven venous congestion. And it's most common in women that are multiparous and premenopausal. Ultrasound or CT can often pick this up and it typically demonstrates ovarian veins greater than five to six millimeters on contrast enhanced CT or ultrasound or multiple dilated pelvic veins on Valsalva. Indications for treatment in pelvic venous congestion include well, rec uh, well rec unfortunately, it's a well recognized but poorly understood condition, presents with symptoms of non cyclic pelvic and sometimes abdominal pain with greater than six months duration. 
Symptoms include dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, hemorrhoids, bladder irritability, and bowel irritability. It is an exclusion, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. And diseases that need to be excluded include PID, endometriosis, adenomyosis, fibroids, and prolapse. There's several uh, evidence-based studies that show uh, the uh, benefits of uh, embolotherapy in the treatment of pelvic venous congestion. These include uh, uh, you know, a study, a systemic review and meta-analysis in, meta in 2016, which assessed 21 studies with a patient population of 1,308, which showed that endovascular treatment resulted in early substantial re uh, relief in symptoms of up to 70% of cases, uh, with relief generally increased over time and sustained. Our uh, European uh, colleagues uh, who um, have released uh, the standardized algorithm for treatment uh, found that it was a relatively simple, safe and effective uh, technique for occluding and obliterating reflux veins associated with pelvic venous congestion syndrome. So what do we do in these cases uh, when we get asked to do uh, embolotherapy for this condition? Typically, uh, I will get access to the internal jugular vein. Um, the procedure can be performed from the, vent, uh, the femoral vein, but we find that based on the angulation of the vessels, it's typically easier, easier to perform the pr uh, procedure from the, from the neck. Um, we take a catheter, so this is an MPA catheter, down uh, from the jugular uh, through the atrium uh, into the inferior vena cava, and then we cannulate the left renal vein. We squirt, squirt contrast into the left renal vein, uh, which demonstrates uh, in positive patients, reflux of the contrast down an incompetent vein um, with dysfunction of the valves. Typically the contrast wouldn't go down this level uh, because of the, um, the uh, forward flow uh, associated with the, uh, the valves within the vein. So here you can see the gonadal or ovarian vein filling with contrast. Once we get access and can prove that there's reflux, we take our macro catheter down into the, uh, into the uh, ovarian vein and then perform a further injection to show the incompetent distended veins within the pelvis. Once we're at this level, we then inject a sclerosin, which is called fibrovein, to uh, thrombose the pelvic vessels. And then as we exit, we deploy platinum coils and plugs with a sandwich technique. I've, I've drawn uh, pink uh, swirls to indicate where we inject our embolic coil, embolic coil, until we come up to the, uh, just uh, before the insertion of the uh, ovarian vein into the renal vein. And at the end, we do an injection of contrast to show that there's good preservation of the left renal vein. Uh, after the procedure and no further reflux down the gonadal vein. Um, following completion uh, of, of the embolization, we proceed to then uh, assess the pelvic veins by the internal iliac uh, veins uh, and demonstrate that there's no further uh, reflex, which is contributed to these uh, venous outflow channels. So in this case, there was competent pelvic veins. So the key points for this is that um, this procedure is performed under uh, light sedation. It's performed with a two millimeter incision, either within the groin or the neck, local anesthetic. It's a 30 to 60 minute procedure and the patient's discharged the same day. Complications include post-procedural pain of less than 5% and very, very rarely renal vein thrombosis or coil migration, which is reported at less than 2%. Another uh, treatment uh, which is in the realm of uh, distended veins is uh, the male varicocele, uh, which we can perform embolization on. A varicocele is a collection of varicose veins within the panpiniform or spermatic plexus, secondary to reflux in the internal spermatic vein. Uh, it uh, occurs in approximately 10 to 15% of the general population. 40% of men undergoing infertility workup uh, have been identified to have varicoceles. 
it's seen to be bilateral and it's quite a large reference range in about 17 to 70% of men. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis and in, in general practice, you've probably come across it a lot. Uh, the examination demonstrating the sensation of a bag of worms. And on ultrasound, we typically see a pan, pan, uh, piniform plexus vein measuring greater than three millimeters uh, with a serpiginous appearance with dissension on Valsalva. There's secondary uh, causes for varicocele, which we need to be aware of. Uh, and um, this can be caused by increased pressures in the testicular vein due to compression or obstruction. And causes of that can be retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, uh, renal masses, renal vein thrombosis or splenorenal shunts in portal, uh, portal hypertension. So I've got a nice picture here. This is of an ultrasound in a patient which demonstrated uh, a left uh, isolated varicocele uh, where you can see the serpigent uh, Doppler flow um, throughout and en engorgement of uh, those vessels on Valsalva on ultrasound. And the patient subsequently went on to have a CT, which demonstrated a large uh, perihylar renal mass, uh, which was compressing the uh, left uh, renal vein and thus causing reflux within the left gonadal vein. Typically in, uh, I should say, within normal anatomy, within uh, men and women uh, that the ovarian vein or the gonadal vein on the left will insert into the left renal and the right uh, gonadal or ovarian vein will insert it directly into the IVC. So that's one of the reasons that lengthening of the course of the drainage is one of the reasons why you have a predisposition uh, to having left-sided pathologies in both men and women. So indications for treatment of varicoceles include infertility in patients with semen abnormalities, chronic groin pain, testicular atrophy in adolescent patients, recurrent disease after prior treatment. Um, there's variable evidence uh, that indicates that treatment indications can be low serum testosterone with or without erectile dysfunction, BPH, uh, and enhancement of assisted fertility techniques but generally most of our referrals are for, uh, for uh, men that are uh, seeking for, uh, infertility treatments and chronic uh, groin pain. Um, the evidence for varicocele embolization, um, there, uh, there was a large systemic review and meta-analysis which documented 16 studies and 2,136 patients. And that showed that endovascular treatments had rates of adverse events, ra rates of adverse events from embolotherapy as opposed to surgery were lower, but both treatments had similar rates of recurrence and pregnancy outcomes compared to surgical uh, treatments. Um, the CERCI standards of practice uh, and their literature review found that uh, orcalgia uh, resolution or relief was seen in uh, varicocele embolization to be approximately 86.9 to 100% in uh, case assessments and post-procedural pregnancy rates were fairly broad, but approximately 33 to 70.8% improvement in fertility. Um, so how do we perform the procedure? Um, so this is just typically we do a pre-procedural ultrasound. So this is the uh, ultrasound demonstrating a serpiginous left spermatic cord uh, with um, a varicocele. Uh, the patient has had targeted ultrasound of the left kidney, which demonstrates that there is no evidence of a left, left kidney mass or abnormality uh, predisposing them to a varicocele. The patient had a completely normal uh, right testis and uh, spermatic cord. Again, similar to ovarian vein embolization, um, I typically prefer a small incision in the neck and access into the uh, internal jugular vein. Um, as you can see, it's just the course of the um, the course that you take, which is all completely downstream uh, with um, 
uh, with a jugular part puncture typically allows you to get into the gonadal vein within approximately three to five minutes. While a femoral puncture, you tend to have to come uh, upwards and then over and then back down. So it really creates a more tortuous curve. I always consent the patient to give them the option of the two and generally knowing that it's a faster procedure, uh, they'll, they'll always go for a, a neck puncture, but I'm more than happy to do femoral access. That's what I used to do um, as a standard. But now finding that you can get in so much faster, um, here you can see I've got an MPA catheter, which just has a slight turn on it, which we come down, we access the, again, the left renal vein. Um, I inject contrast at the level of the renal vein, which shows prompt uh, filling of the, um, of the gonadal vein consistent with reflux. And um, we ended up measuring this vessel at around 10 to 12 millimetres. So given, you know, uh, normal is about uh, half or less than that, it's a significantly uh, incompetent uh, vessel. Once we get our macro catheter into the gonadal vein, we take it as distally as we can and again, do a confirmatory check. So we inject contrast down, which you can see there's clear filling of the gonadal vein, no significant um, uh, collateral flow, which we have to be concerned about. And you can see that there's filling of those serpiginous vessels um, in the pelvis, uh, in, in the spermatic cord. Uh, once we get there, I further advance my macro catheter down to the plexus where we get the patient to put groin pressure on. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't, unlike in women, we don't want our sclerosant to um, penetrate down into the testis because it can cause um, uh, epididymitis or calger um, or uh, potentially um, cause inadvertent embolization of the testis. So we typically get the patient to put significant pressure on their groin just to re prevent reflux. But further than that, we, uh, we uh, put multiple platinum coils just before we deploy the sclerosin to block off the blood vessel. And then again, we just like in the ovarian uh, embolization, um, we uh, perform a sandwich technique. So we perform coil uh, matrixes interspersed with a fibrotic agent called fibrovane, and then further coil and then fibrovein, and then further coils. So we get a nice embolization, exclusion of any blood flow through that, uh, through that testicular um, vein. Um, at conclusion of the procedure, and once we're satisfied that we've got good uh, embolic response, we do a check uh, venogram through the, uh, through the left renal vein, and you can see that there's nice linear flow through the vein, renal vein, no evidence of thrombus, and a nice barrier of coil, nice perfect two centimetre distance of coil to vein, um, uh, which demonstrates good embolization and good preservation of all the vital structures. So I guess the key points for varicocele embolization, again, it's performed under sedation. We do a two millimeter incision in either the groin or the neck. It's performed under local anesthetic and it's a same day discharge procedure. So the patient's uh, discharged several hours after just uh, routine sedation obs. Complications uh, of varicocele is post-procedural pain, um, epididymitis or uh, orcoepididymitis and pampiniform thrombophlebitis, which is reported at approximately less than 5%. I typically give a small amount of, dex, uh, of steroid to mitigate this. And I've found that since doing that, patients don't tend to get um, uh, post-procedural pain. And very, very rarely, probably about this, uh, very, very rarely, about the same probably as the ovarian vein embolization procedures, there can be uh, incidences uh, reported in the literature of renal vein thrombosis or even coil migration. Um, so the key points for tonight, um, interventional radiologists are specialists in imaging guided minimally invasive procedures. Uh, interventional radiologists are highly skilled in endovascular interventions. UAE offers a true alternative to hysterectomy, which is a safe and, uh, safe and effective in symptomatic control for patients who wish to preserve their uterus. UAE uh, should be offered to all patients in this cohort. Embolotherapy offers a treatment option for a variety of pathologies, not limited to those discussed today. 
and embolization and imaging guided interventions are complex procedures and should only perform, be performed by clinicians with specialist training in diagnostic imaging and who are experienced and highly trained in embolotherapy. Um, again, uh, if anyone that's watching this, uh, if you want any advice on interventional radiology, uh, potential treatments for their patients, feel free to contact me uh, direct at any time, either through the Geelong Hospital switch uh, or through my uh, mobile number provided previously. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Steel. If you've got any questions, could you please type them in? And um, we, we do have a little bit of time. I just I'll put my had. Number up. Yep. I do have um, one question. I'm not sure whether it was covered or not. Any comment on geniculate artery embolization? Um, there's been a lot of studies that show good results with geniculate artery embolization. Um, uh, we're keen to offer it at Geelong Hospital and um, we're just looking into uh, uh, trying to start that back up at the hospital. Um, uh, but there's a lot of good data that has come out of Geelong Hospital in the past uh, with that procedure. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Again, again that's stage. a procedure that should only be performed by uh, interventional radiologists. Mm -hmm. Just wait a few minutes, see if there's any other questions come in. Just take this opportunity to thank Steele for his presentation. Great presentation, very informative. Thank you so much, Steele. Um, I didn't do the screen share at the beginning. <laughs> eh? Oh, yeah, that's all right. Um, what else? Yeah, and please put in your comments on your evaluations if there's any other radiology topics that you may be interested in hearing about because we can um, certainly address those later in the year. What about the cost with this procedure, private versus public? Uh, public, there's no costs. Uh, privately, um, we uh, discuss it with the health funds to make sure that there's uh, no costs and um, or determine how much uh, the cost is to the patient before we do the procedure, just part of the informed consent process. Uh, but in terms of uh, private procedures, I don't charge any out of pocket for my uh, uh, procedures to my patients. Um, they're all bulk, uh, just bulk billed through their health funds. Um, but um, some health funds uh, cover uh, different amounts for em embolotherapy. So it really just depends on the health fund and that's part of the informed consent process. Okay. But through Thank the hospital, uh, public patients, uh, there, sh there should be no cost. Excellent. Okay, the, there's your evaluation survey on the screen at the moment. Please fill that in. Uh, thank you again, Steele, and we will end, end the webinar now. Thanks, everyone, right. for Thanks, attending. Sarah. See you.